Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good early afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm happy to see the audience numbering in hundreds joining us today. I think that demonstrates the importance of the topic, African megatrends looking over the horizon into the future. My name is uh, Mika Aaltola, the director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. It is my pleasure to announce that FIA's attention to the vast and diverse African continent has solidified through recent recruitments of experts in the field. The topic uh, of today's discussion, led by leading experts, concentrates on megatrends shaping the future of Africa. These include population growth, urbanization, climate change, de uh, democratization, protracted conflicts, connectivity, and of course, geopolitical competition. While recognizing sustainability of positive developments in Africa is somewhat uh, tenuous and uneven, there are both uh, prospects for peace and prosperity. Uh, there's opportunities in Africa. Africa is young and growing. Uh, and it values also good governance in uh, some parts of the vast continent. And there's possibilities for leapfrogging in some fields, exemplified in today's event by digital connectivity. Let me now yield the floor to, uh, on FIA's behalf to chair of the event, Dr. Olli Ruohomäki, who is a non-resident fellow at our institute currently. He is also a senior advisor with the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland. He has extensive knowledge on various topics, so whenever uh, something dealing with, with the world, the different corners of the world pops up in my horizon, uh, Olli is the person to, to usually to call for, and, and, and he knows uh, key aspects of those different scenarios. Olli has just published the FIA briefing paper on the very topic of today's event. I encourage all of you to read through this top-notch paper that Olli has written. So over to Olli now. Uh, thank you very much, Mika, for those kind words. Uh, first, some uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, once we've heard all the speakers, uh, we will have a Q&A uh, session. And please write your questions in the chat box uh, once the last speaker has spoken. And I will then read the questions and comments and uh, to our speakers uh, for the responses. Uh, so before uh, I hand uh, the floor to our speakers, let me uh, briefly set some context to today's webinar. Africa is an enormous continent composed of several regions and four, uh, 54 states populated uh, with more than 1.3 billion people, both low income and high income countries and disparate levels of development are found on the continent. There is both concern and hope in the air regarding the trajectory that Africa's development will take. Uh, despite the complexity that forecasting the future of Africa entails, it is possible to outline the main contours of the trajectory of change that informs uh, the course of the developments on the continent. And there are indeed uh, seven megatrends uh, that I have chosen that shape the future of Africa. One is, uh, first of all, rapid population growth. There's 43 million uh, Africans are born every year, and more than half of global population growth between today and 2050 is expected to occur in Africa. There's a rapid and dysfunctional urbanization going on, African, Africa's urban population is the fastest growing globally, and much of the urbanization is unplanned and unregulated. Climate change. Africa's contribution uh, to cl global climate change in terms of carbon emissions is small, but the continent is disproportionately uh, affected by climate change. Uh, then there's resilience of neo patrimonial politics and slow democratization. I've actually borrowed this term from Jackie Siliers, who will be our main speaker. And, and there's this idea of the resilience of neo patrimonialism, 
that is a major obstacle uh, to Africa's democratization process. Yet uh, the young population is tired of so-called big man politics and they want change. Protracted conflict, I mean, state fragility and violent protracted conflict will remain a major hurdle for the sustainability of any uh, developments that might otherwise uh, take root. And then there are, of course, attempts at connectivity and unlocking trade potential. I mean, greater connectivity is a real prerequisite for the continent to meet the rapidly rising needs of the growing population. Uh, African continental free trade area has potential, and I underline the point, potential to unlock trade uh, and investment. And then there's, of course, the new scramble for Africa. I mean, we, we see, besides the traditional uh, partners such as the European Union and the US, we see China, we see Japan, we see Russia, we see India, we see Turkey, Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries. And all of these are vying for the attention uh, of the rich continent. Uh, next slide, please. So just uh, indeed, the point here is that the sustainability of the developments are somewhat tenuous and uneven, but there are both prospects for peace and prosperity and instability and insecurity. And the young population wants to have a say in the direction that the future takes, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis democracy. And there is possibilities for leapfrogging in some fields. Uh, and one of the messages that I want to uh, <clears throat> point out is that Africa really needs to regain and exert a strong sense of agency, choose its partners uh, wisely and strategically, and avoid becoming a playing field of geopolitical rivalries. Except for climate change, uh, the African megatrends that are shaping the continent's future uh, are very much affected by political choices uh, that African leaders and governments make. Now, I would really uh, want to give the floor to the real Africa experts. It is really my pleasure to welcome Dr. Yaki Siliers from Pretoria. Yaki is the founder and the former executive director of the Institute for Security Studies, ISS. ISS uh, produces top quality research and is one of the very best think tanks. Well, actually, it's the best think tank, in my opinion, on the African continent. Uh, Dr. Siliers current, currently serves as chair of the ISS Board of Trustees and head of African Futures and Innovation Program at the ISS. His 2017 bestseller, Fate of the Nation, addresses South Africa's futures uh, from political, economic and social perspectives. His most recent uh, book, Africa First, Igniting a Growth Revolution was released in March 2020, a year ago. And this book takes a rigorous look at the emerging futures uh, for other African nations and the continent as a whole. Uh, Yaki, I hand the floor to you. Um, thank you very much, Oli, um, and for the opportunity and for the invitation to speak uh, to you and to colleagues and many friends in, in Finland. Um, so I'm going to look long term on the future of the continent. Um, and um, thank you very much again for the opportunity. I want to start off by uh, just uh, starting off with uh, the impact of COVID. And I draw here on a study that we released in the middle of last year, where I summarize the impact of, of COVID and I compare the impact of COVID with um, a pre-COVID growth forecast. So in 2020, uh, 2021 and 2022, the impact of COVID is that we would see extreme poverty using $1.90 increased by about 31, 42 and 24 million people compared to a pre-COVID uh, forecast. Uh, we see GDP, uh, the size of the African economy contracting uh, by about 184, 152, 134 billion dollars uh, compared to a pre-COVID forecast. Now bear in mind the African economy is I think what is it, 2.3 trillion dollars. We see government revenues decline 
uh, by 61 to 25 billion dollars and that is a huge impact because with lower government revenues it means African governments have less ability to provide education, to provide water sanitation and to provide security. And the result is that uh, we see the um, increase in instability on the continent. And then um, one of the scenarios uh, with regard to additional mortality, about 165, 168 um, additional Africans um, succumbing to COVID. Of course, mortality is very low in Africa because of our relatively a youthful population. Uh, the main driver of uh, the impact of COVID in Africa is not mortality or even infections. It is basically the knock-on effect of the economic contra uh, contraction. So to put that into context, this shows um, uh, millions of people on the left hand side, time at the bottom. Uh, the blue line shows um, the pre-COVID forecast of extreme poverty. So we came from, we're about at what's at 455 million Africans living in extreme poverty. Our forecast on is that Africa will, even before COVID, have missed the Sustainable Development Goal 1 of eliminating extreme poverty by a substantial mar margin. Um, and then compared to the pre-COVID forecast, extreme poverty, as I showed a little bit earlier, is increasing either by 31 or this, this year 42 million and next year about 24 million additional Africans that will probably be, could be classified as being extremely poor. So whereas in 2019, about 455 million Africans could be classified as uh, living in extreme poverty, we are now going to get to about what is it? Um, 30 instead of 29% uh, by about 31% Africans living in extreme poverty. So the impact of COVID is really severe. If we look at GDP per capita, um, the blue line represents GDP per capita, average GDP per person uh, in Africa. The red line indicates the impact of COVID. Um, so GDP per capita last year declined by about $281. This year it will decline by about 217 compared to a pre-COVID forecast. Um, and it's very likely that Africa will only recover to its 2019, in other words, its pre-COVID uh, growth for, um, GDP per capita level in about 2025, 2026. So that's why we refer to almost a decade of, uh, of loss in economic growth and the impact of COVID-19 on Africa. So the study that we did in, in uh, July of last year really came to four conclusions. Uh, it pointed to an emerging debt crisis um, uh, that will require a moratorium and likely some debt forgiveness. Uh, the need to spend and increase health spending. Uh, Africa spends significantly below the average for, uh, for other countries at similar levels of development. Uh, the fact that Africa needs to invest in basic infrastructure, just as one example, the average um, access to improved sanitation in Africa is 40%. It's half what it is in the rest of the world. And then uh, the need for greater efforts towards the economic transformation of African economies. And um, here I'm uh, going forward, going to draw on Africa First, the book, um, Oli, that you were kind enough to speak about in the beginning that came out uh, in the beginning of, no of last year. And we've been doing a lot of work on updating uh, that uh, the, the forecasts in that book. Now, a lot of our work at the African, Future, <laughs> African Futures and Innovation Program is really about this graph. This is a graph that looks at uh, the every, uh, that looks at GDP per capita in Africa versus, and Africa is the green line, the average in the rest of the world. And you can immediately see the challenge, a growing divergence. This divergence has been growing since the 1960s. Things are getting better in Africa, but significantly more slower than the averages in the rest of the world. We are falling further and further behind. So whereas in 1990, the average GDP per capita in Africa was about 36% that in the rest of the world, it's now about 26% and will be uh, probably by about 27% by 2040. And this is despite the fact that our growth forecast is that Africa will grow at about 5% average, double the average growth rate of that of the rest of the world. So um, to rapidly grow, Africa needs, or all economies, need to improve productivity in agriculture, industry, 
and services. And it needs to move labor from a low productivity sector like agriculture to a high productivity sector like manufacturing or high end services. And it needs to grow the formal sector. Only employment in the formal sector improves stability, reduces inequality and contributes tax revenues that enable governments to roll out health, education and infrastructure. The problem is that what is happening in Africa is that labor is moving from, from subsistence agriculture uh, in the rural areas to low end uh, retail services in urban informal areas. And that is not really productivity enhancing. We also see the growth in capital intensive resource and energy based industries that generate few jobs. Um, close to South Africa, where I am in the northern part of Mozambique, we are shortly going to see a massive uh, uh, liquid uh, natural gas uh, program. But the question is, what will that do in actual fact to general development in Mozambique? So in the scenarios, what we do is uh, that I'm going to show you, we have basically two scenarios. Um, we have a current path scenario. That's where we think Africa is headed. And then we um, intervene on every sector of Africa for a 10 year period from 2023 till 2033. That's sort of the second 10 year implementation plan of the agenda 2063 long term horizon, let's say on agriculture. And then we look at the results in 2043 and further on. So um, uh, we typically analyze the results on changes in levels of extreme poverty economic size with GDP and GDP per capita. So um, I said that, so now I'm going to speak a little bit about the kind of analysis that we first did in Africa first. Um, so we first look at what is the impact of a more rapid demographic transition. Africa is on average about 30 years away from entering its demographic dividend. And then it will only stay in that demographic dividend for a relatively short period compared to many other countries. We look at the impact of better basic infrastructure and health. What would be the impact of an agricultural revolution? Africans love to talk about agriculture, but in actual fact, we have done very little. And uh, the continent has not seen the kind of agricultural revolution that you've seen in Brazil, in India and in China. We then look at the impact of better or education that's orientated to demand. What is the impact of a low end manufacturing growth path? Most countries, particularly the Asian tigers and much of Europe, of course, went up the manufacturing curve. And that is because in Africa, manufacturing is six times more productive than agriculture. Then I'm going to look at the impact of leapfrogging through technology. Uh, particularly the uh, digitization and um, particularly renewables. What is the potential impact of the implementation of the African continental free trade area on the future of Africa? What is the role of external support? That is, or the external community, remittances, foreign direct investment, aid, and less illicit financial flows. What is the impact of relieving the bulk infrastructure backlog of Africa? What could be the contrib contribution of better governance, uh, improved stability? And then uh, we call this uh, an agenda 2063 scenario and um, uh, also look at the impact on all of these, as well as uh, the impact of carbon emissions and climate change and the impact uh, on all of these scenarios in the future of, of work. Now, Oli, you and others that have read the book would know that these are basically, each, each one of these scenarios is a chapter in Africa first. So I'm now going to show you what is the combined impact of each of these scenarios on Africa's GDP. So first, this is Africa's GDP um, in 2011 constant US dollars from 2019 before COVID. You can see the impact of COVID here uh, out till 2043. Um, remember that I said that we do the interventions for 10 years until 2033, and then we look on the impact out till 2043. So that would be the impact of a more rapid demographic transition. Um, I've already made a remark or two about that. Uh, remember that these interventions now all start in 2023, but of course, population, to total fertility rates take a long time to have an impact. 
that would be the impact of um, better um, basic infrastructure, water, sanitation, health infrastructure, and basic health care. That would be the impact of an agricultural revolution in Africa. You can immediately see that agriculture has significantly more potential than almost any other scenario in the next 20, 30 years to change the fortunes of the continent. That is the impact of better education. Education is a generational challenge. Finland has some of the best educational systems in the year. It takes decades uh, to transform uh, education. That's why the longer your time horizon, the more powerful education uh, is. But uh, even my 2043 impact quite limited. That is the impact of a, a low end manufacturing transition. Um, where Africa enters uh, low end manufacturing. Manufacturing is important because of its forward and backward linkages to agriculture and to services. Um, this is the impact of leapfrogging, where we particularly look at the implementation of um, renewables, um, as well as the more rapid formalization of the informal sector, which is one of the spin offs of digitization. Um, this is the impact of uh, a more foreign direct investment, more aid, uh, less illicit financial flows and more remittances on Africa. This is the impact of the implementation of the African continental free trade area. In fact, over long, uh, over medium to long term time horizons, the um, potential of the African continental free trade area is larger than any other scenario. This is the impact of uh, large infrastructure projects, um, and this is a very interesting area that we can engage upon, but this is railways, ports, harbors, better road and so on. This is the impact of better institutional governance. Now, I'm always asked about what is the relationship between democracy and, and development, and what we measure here is what contribution does um, a, a better governance contribute to Africa's development and well at low levels of development democracy plays very little role but the, the more higher you go up the uh, GDP per capita and the educational ladder the more important it becomes. This is the impact of less risk of investment um, in Africa um, and this is then if, if all of these good things come together you get a combined impact. We refer to that as the synergistic impact um, because um, better uh, if your labor force is better fed, they are better educated, they are more productive. So it's the synergistic impact. So that is the combined impact. So the first story I want to say is that there's no magic bullet to Africa. Africa needs to do all of these things. Yes, it depends upon the country. Now, of course, this is a picture of 54 countries, Oli, as you said, in Africa. It's a gross overgeneralization. So we can look at Africa and look at the what is the best impact of the scenarios by looking at Africa's income groups. So the map at the bottom indicates uh, which African countries are high income. Those are the two island states of Seychelles and Mauritius. Then upper middle income countries, South Africa is one, Botswana, Namibia, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea and Libya still at the moment technically. And the 23 lower middle and 23 low income countries. So at the top, you can see that for low income countries in 2023, agriculture, leapfrogging and trade have the most impact. By 2043, uh, free trade, the implementation of the African continental free trade area has the most impact. Um, leapfrogging a second and agriculture falls behind. If you look at low, Africa's 23 low middle income countries, agriculture falls to third place. Uh, trade becomes uh, the first, uh, the most important by 2043. Leapfrogging remains second. And then if you go to uh, Africa's uh, seven, I think it is, upper middle income countries, uh, which is a, uh, it includes countries like Equatorial Guinea and Gabon, which creates a bit of a problem. But uh, again, the free trade area has the most impact, followed by basic health care um, and more foreign direct investment and then infrastructure. And we can look at these scenarios and how they change um, for low income, low middle and upper middle income countries. There are 11 scenarios that I model. So you can look how the scenarios change from 2023 till 2043 for low income, lower middle, 
and upper middle income countries. It's a bit of a confusing diagram, I know, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, um, but uh, we can always return to this. We now have spent a lot of time on uh, refining these scenarios down to country level. So I'll just show you one example. This is the um, this is for four uh, low income countries. Um, and it basically is a forecast of what their GDP per capita would be in 2043 in the current path, that is the blue at the bottom, and then what their GDP per capita would be additionally um, with the contribution from these 11 scenarios. So you can see Ethiopia will do extraordinarily well. Um, Chad, the DRC, Central African Republic, and then we can also look at what, what exactly, what contributes the most to the improvement. So um, that's what the contribution from the center, th that top green, the 1,007 uh, additional um, dollars per capita would be contributed. And this is the breakdown of the most important scenarios that contribute to that. So uh, for example, remember we said trade, this is the yellow, is very important, the implementation of the African continental free trade area. We said agriculture was very important and so on. So uh, just to give you an idea that we can um, now refine these scenarios down to country level uh, basis. If all of these good things happen together, and I know this is a bit of a complicated picture, then uh, this is what will happen. Remember the, the graph that I showed you? This is Africa's GDP per capita before COVID. Um, the green line is Africa's GDP per capita with COVID, and then the dashed line is what would happen um, with uh, interventions that start in 2023, um, and you would gain about two years in terms of GDP per capita. So, long, lots of graphs, lots of data, but um, basically the story is Africa needs to speed up its social, economic and political transition by going more rapidly up its demographic dividend, particularly low income countries, rolling out improved water, sanitation and basic health care. It needs to invest in education, agriculture and manufacturing. But since it will not produce enough jobs, it will need to expand the provision of social grants while using digitization and the fourth industrial revolution to leapfrog. Trade integration will be key. In other words, the establishment of a continental free trade area, as will be efforts to reduce violence, but this and improved governance will take time. Leadership, we can't model leadership, but if you look at the institutional relationships, they only change slowly. In the meanwhile, aid and remittances will remain important for poor countries, your low and lower middle income countries, even as your middle income countries invest and attract more foreign direct investment. Each scenario impacts differently on carbon emissions and on jobs, but it differs and it differs from country to country and lots of more work will be required. But this is really the work that we've done uh, to put Africa first and to unleash a growth revolution. Oli, so um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I think I'll stop there. I've spoken for a long time and that is basically a summary of, uh, of the book. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Yaki. I mean, that was really fascinating stuff. A lot of food uh, for thought to digest. Uh, let me now turn uh, to the commentators and first we'll have Professor Lisa Laxo, who is by far the best Finnish Africa scholar and expert that I know. Years ago, Lisa, I recall I asked you to do some consultancy work on the African Union on behalf of the Finnish uh, <coughs> Foreign Affairs, because uh, we're planning some support. Uh, for the peace and security sector at the time. So Lisa Laxo uh, is a senior researcher currently in the Nordic uh, Africa Institute uh, in Uppsala, Sweden. Dr. Laxo is an expert on world politics and international development cooperation. Her research interests uh, include political science, African studies, democratization of Africa, world politics, crisis management, foreign policy, EU-Africa policy and the global role of the European Union. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Olli, and thank you for inviting me here. It's uh, indeed a pleasure and uh, thank you, Yaki, for your presentation. It, uh, it's also 
Uh, it has been a pleasure for me to follow your work uh, uh, already, I think, two decades. Uh, it's it's a long time when we we first met. Um, you, uh, you emphasized uh, the importance of uh, productivity and, uh, and uh, its uh, uh, importance for uh, formal sector employment and uh, and uh, you also showed clearly how uh, how investments in in these different uh, sectors uh, can bring positive development together uh, but uh, you, uh, you you said that governance is a long term project and uh, and you mentioned stability and uh, democracy uh, as uh, as uh, areas where I improvement will be seen uh, on a later phase, I would say. Uh, but uh, maybe Maya, if you can show the slide on on fragility, uh, the fund for peace, uh, which is. Uh, uh, producing this uh, ranking of, uh, of uh, fragility, which shows that uh, Africa by far as a continent is a continent of the most fragile states in the world. And I think that uh, this is uh, one of the key uh, potential obstacles to that uh, positive development. And, uh, Therefore, if we think that the, there are continental level challenges that require continent level solutions, how then to proceed to continent level policy making when, when the state fragility is, uh, is so high? Uh, if the nation, nation building projects uh, still are ongoing. Um, so uh, Africa's uh, democratization wave is already a quarter of century old. The expectations were very high, but uh, we still see um, uh, uh, big uh, obstacles in uh, in uh, in democratization. For instance, electoral violence. Uh, uh, about uh, half of all the elections in Africa are estimated to experience electoral violence when the international figure is about uh, 20 percent. And another trend in Africa is the willingness of the leaders to prolong the, the, the rule through constitutional changes. There are a lot of examples uh, Republic of Congo, Burundi, Zambia, I mean, you, you, you mentioned it. But uh, uh, the uh, regional organizations and the regional initiatives uh, have, uh, have, uh, have adopted legal norms to prevent such moves. For instance, the African Union, African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, which has been in force since uh, 2012. It stipulates that if you change the constitution, it should be for your successor, not for yourself. Uh, then also uh, regional organizations have been working for uh, free and fair and peaceful conduct of elections. It's often maybe not uh, uh, so well remembered, but for instance, in Southern Africa, SADC was very important in, in Zimbabwe at the time of the, uh, of the uh, uh, inclusive government. It was important in the uh, electoral processes in, in Madagascar, which was then suspended from from SADC. So uh, what I would like to uh, say is that, uh, or what, what I would like to uh, hear also your, your opinion, Yaki, that what is the, what can be the role of these regional initiatives and regional organizations? And could we think a little bit out of the box? Could it be that uh, in Africa, these regional bodies can really be empowered, even though, and perhaps also because the nation states are 
weak and the governance structures at the nation state level are weak. Could it be possible to create uh, um, African type of uh, multi-level governance uh, uh, which is legitimate and where uh, regional bodies can uh, interact with uh, sub-national sub levels also, private sector, uh, civil society. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, what uh, what I think that uh, that uh, could provide uh, opportunities for for good governance, even though the the state structures and uh, and problems like corruption, for instance, are are uh, 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 obstacles for for such uh, positive developments as you as you uh, described, and then um, about the uh, about the scenarios. Uh, if if then if we if we think that the, the state level developments and. Uh, and uh, national level developments are the key. Do you then think that these um, driving forces are the sub-regional hegemonic powers? Uh, do, what do you think w w would be the role of uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Africa, of course, we know. But uh, is that uh, then um, uh, one scenario that, uh, that this uh, uh, that African, uh, the strongest states in Africa are going to be the the leading or the driving forces of the change. Thank you. This is from my part. Thank you very much for that, Lisa. Excellent. Uh, now let me turn to the second commentator, a good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Marti Eirola. Marti Eirola is a senior advisor on Africa policy in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland. Previously, Dr. Eirola served in various departments of the ministry at embassies uh, of Finland in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania and Cairo, Egypt. And he was also the representative of Finland to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, he has experience from Africa on political development, economic, cultural and security issues. Marti, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for for the invitation to 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 this seminar. Thank you only to your kind words and your 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 study, you, your, the paper you published. Thank you also, Yaki, for for your contribution. And uh, I'm going to read your 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 book. I'm not, I haven't done it yet, but uh, I'll add it on my my night table. And uh, then Lisa, also, thank you very much for your for your questions and and, and comments. When we think about uh, megatrends, I think uh, what is needed now is, um, is a question of definition. You can put my first slide. Uh, wh when we think about what is, what, what does it mean when we speak about a, a megatrend? What, what is a megatrend in Africa? And then we, we have to, or in my thinking, it means a kind of very deep and long-term transformation process that, that um, that is um, irreversible. I mean, we cannot turn back the, the time, we cannot rewind the clock. So um, when we speak about the deep and long-term transformation, one key thing is that this impact on society is, is really deep. I mean, it's really a question of transformation. And, and th then secondly, when we speak about long-term, it means um, the importance of time dimension here. Now, we have to look 30 years back. But then also we can we can look 30 years ahead. So we need this time dimension to keep in mind. Um, and then also one key thing is that, in my thinking, is this uh, fact that a megatrend is supposed to be like a, a continent-wise, I mean, a continental process. And um, as I said, uh, in the, uh, when you speak about uh, megatrend and time dimension, there is an uh, element of foresight 
foresight, uh, especially, especially when you speak about mitigation or adaptation, then the question of foresight is very, very important. So in other words, to see what is the, what is the future going to, to look at, to, to look. Uh, we commissioned by the ministry a, a study on megatrends two years ago, 2019, and it's published in our ministry's website. And then we, um, or, or the, the researchers we had, they regarded population growth and climate change as a kind of mega, mega trends. Uh, they, they have especially strong effect on other trends. Um, and uh, actually, these questions were already addressed very much by, by Yaki. Then also, other mega trends were, that, that were, were included in the, in the commissioned study was urbanization, migration, technological development, and democratic development. A key point is that all these megatrends, they, uh, they are interlinked and they affect each other. And in particular, as I said, population growth and climate change are the, perhaps the most important ones, the really mega, megatrends. Sometimes also, as we have seen in this um, occasion even, we have also economic development as a megatrend, also conflicts. Uh, Oli uh, was speaking about protracted conflicts. Integration sometimes is regarded as a megatrend. Also, scramble for Africa was mentioned, and then the pandemics. This could, could also be regarded as megatrends, but um, depending on, on the definition. And then what is also very interesting is that when we speak about megatrends, then the combination, that, that's, that's very interesting. And uh, I'm very happy what uh, Yaki said about this synergy uh, impact of, of the scenarios. Um, for example, when we speak about young population as a, an outcome of the population growth, and then we have urbanization, and we, then we add new technology. This is very interesting combination. To, to my mind, it means a lot of new opportunities in, in the positive thinking, especially. We, in, in the case of, of megatrends, um, I have the feeling that, um, in, in my thinking, individual citizens and even individual states are, are somehow powerless. I mean, if they are left alone, and that's why, and especially in Africa, as we, we heard, very fragile continent, very fragile states, weak and even failed states. So they are very, um, next slide, please. They are, they are really uh, like powerless if they are alone trying to address these megatrends. So simply, multilateralism is the, is the response in Africa, in the continent, but then also global governance, coalitions, partnerships, but then also national approach, as, as Lisa mentioned, uh, in African countries. This is also a question how they regard multilateralism. In African continent, we have the African Union, other pan-African institutions, uh, multilateral institutions, and then these regional economic co communities. So it's very difficult for one state to deal with roots and causes of megatrends, especially because very often they, can, they come from outside. They originate from outside. They are regional or global by nature. Um, so what I have in mind, and this is something also maybe a question, how much shall we focus on adaptation and how much we can focus on mitigation? In other words, how to manage these megatrends, especially when we speak about challenges, but then also opportunities. How to manage them? For example, when we have the question of urbanization, we, we, we see now the, the outcome. I mean, there's, if there is no control, it doesn't take place in orderly manner. We, we hardly can see any city, proper city planning. There's a big challenge on that, and minimizing harms and risks. So we need a kind of compre comprehensive approach. So the future is that if nothing is done, then we have this, uh, the trends will go on, population will grow, climate change will continue, uncontrolled 
urbanization, urbanization will expand and so on. So the, the outcome is that it will lead to competition, competition for natural resources like land, water, minerals, but then also other resources and uh, especially technology, like we have seen in, in the case of vaccines, a lot of competition now, national, I mean, between the states and even continents. So G5, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, this kind of technology competition will, will grow. So it means also then politically, like protect, pro and also economically, protectionist, nationalism, the question of uh, governance, as it, it was mentioned by, by Yaki and, 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 and Lisa, the question of conflicts because uh, of, uh, of competition, instability, decline of economic poverty, and so on. So Africa will be weak, and then we can see these external powers to, to play a big role there if Africa re remain weak, if nothing is done. So to manage megatrends, the effects and consequences, we need um, the responsibility of African governments, leadership, also civil society, business sector, and so on. They, they have their role to play. And um, then we have global um, co cooperation to address these megatrends, like climate warming, for example. We have um, external, external cooperation needed, like joint actions and partnerships. Especially in the case of Africa we and, and, and Finland, we have the European Union there as well. For example, the question of building back better and greener. Jaki already, already mentioned the expectations, very high ex expectations on this Africa continental free trade area and the, all the reforms that are needed to implement it and to make it true. Now, if you look at uh, just briefly the the new Finnish Africa strategy that was, um, it's, it will be published actually on Thursday. It was approved by the, by the State Council last week. So there's more, more it's, emphasize, it emphasize, it's emphasizing political and economic relations. Development cooperation will continue as well. A lot of opportunities for Finland. And we try to diversify diversify and deepen Finland's relations with African countries, especially political and economic relations. We have um, more importance now in this new strategy on African integration for, for, for many reasons. And um, we see that both mitigation of megatrends, but then also adaptation um, of a lot of upper European Union and member states, including Finland, political opportunities, also economic opportunities in form of partnerships. Just uh, then, uh, finally, a short question to, to Yaki, and this is about the this demographic uh, dividends. Uh, I remember it was uh, 2017 when we, when we had the EU uh, AU summit, and then the theme of that year was this demographic dividend. Now, it's somehow understood very in a very simple way perhaps too simple way. I would appreciate if you could um, explain a little bit more. You said it should be more rapidly, this uh, demographic dividend to come. So how, how to make it more rapid? This is my, my, my question. Thank you very much. I, I, I stop here now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Marti. Wonderful. So I will, before I open up the Q&A uh, for everybody to participate, I'd like to turn over to Yaki and uh, zoom on uh, Lisa's question on democracy and uh, development and conflict and institutional building in Africa. And then on Marty's question on the dem demographic dividend. Uh, so the floor is yours, Yaki. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I do uh, long-term forecasting, so I look at structural relationships. And the structural relationships are, in one sense, quite simple. Poor countries have poor governance because governments have very limited capacity. Rich countries have lots of government capacity because government has the capacity. So 
has, has tax revenues and uh, government revenues that allow it to provide security and capacity. That is not the case in Africa. If you want to do a map of which countries in the world are unstable, just look at which countries are poor. Government capacity, um, which you, the best way to look at that is just to look at uh, government revenues versus uh, uh, GDP or GDP per capita. <clears throat> and so poor countries have bad governance and, uh, and poor governance, and that only improves really over time. As countries gain more capacity, their governance improves and their corruption comes down. Um, so uh, in, in response to the point, the very useful and important points that Lisa has made, I think that um, the contribution that the regional economic communities can make um, are largely to serve as norm entrepreneurs. They, they set norms um, and they serve um, to assist Africa. They, they set standards um, and many African, and that has played a huge role. But the most important, but like with the European Union and, and with others, um, the Africa Union and the regional economic communities reflect the weaknesses of the African states, which are the building blocks of, uh, of the regional economic communities and of the Africa Union. And, I, and, my, and, and they bring additional capacity, but their additional capacity is quite limited. So they can serve a norm entrepreneurial role. They can help, they can hold, and they set standards. And that has proven quite effective. Uh, when I started working with the Organization of African Unity, the predecessor to the Africa Union three decades ago, it was entirely a leadership of um, unelected military governments. Today, almost all of them are elected. Of course, the quality of democracy is poor. Now, democracy um, is also, to a large extent, when you look long-term trends, is a, little, is a, a function of, um, of development. Rich countries that are liberal democracies means that democracy translates into accountability. What we have in Africa, and the VDEM project has done excellent work on this, for example, is you have thin democracy, you have electoral democracy. We go through the motions of democracy, but in actual fact, it doesn't really translate into substantive or liberal democracy. But of course, over time, each time you have elections, the quality of that democracy does improve. And Africa have, faces the challenge, different to the history of the Asian tigers and of China, of having to develop and to democratize in parallel with one another. The history of the Asian tigers of Europe and uh, of China, well, China we don't know, uh, is that uh, democratize, that um, development preceded democratization. That is, when we look long term, we say that there are three phases in the Westphalian state formation process. There's the creation of a security community, there is the building of state capacity, and then states become more gain more capacity. Um, sorry, uh, it's security capacity and they become more inclusive, the three phases. Now, Africa has, in today's world, has to do all of these things at the same time. It's a, it's a huge challenge. I'll summarize that part just to make the point that I think one must have realistic expectations of what is possible. Levels of democracy in Africa nominally is generally quite high. If you look at Africa's development in terms of GDP per capita and levels of education, I, I think that the uh, regional economic communities help, but they cannot compensate. This is a long and a slow process. Then the other question that I'll just briefly respond to is this issue of the demographic dividend. The demographic dividend is simply the relationship of uh, children below 15 and elderly above 65 to the working age population, the population 15 to 64 years of age. Because Africa largely has a large working age, a large population, um, the size of its labor force relative to its dependence is very important because there are three contribu contributors to uh, improved productivity. There's labor, capital, and technology. The one thing that Africa has is labor, but we have such a young population, so many children that you can't feed the kids, educate them, and put them through school rapidly enough. You can't, in actual fact, invest in your working age population 15 to 64. So 
what can be done about this? The most important, of course, over a long-term structural situation is the relationship between men and women. Uh, that lies at the heart of this, but that only changes slowly. What is required in Africa is honest and direct discussions about the importance of demographics. There are countries in Africa, particularly in the Sahel, like Mali, even the DRC, Mali, um, Chad and so on, they have such, I mean, their median age is just above 16 years of age. They have, they have uh, fertility rates of six, seven children per fertile woman. You cannot develop a country. You cannot un under those circumstances. So the most important and the most um, beyond leadership is to make modern contraceptives available to Africans rapidly and roll it out. Our analysis is that um, uh, the provision of modern contraceptives in Africa, the, the deficit in the provision is equal to about two children per woman across the continent. In short, Africa at the moment, Sub-Saharan Africa only gets to a positive relationship of working age people to dependents by about 2053. Just think of that. We are three year, three decades away from getting to a demographic dividend when labor plays a positive role in productivity. We have to speed that up. There are countries like in North Africa and in Southern Africa, which are much more advanced. South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia. But for much of Sub-Saharan Africa, if you if you can't get on top of your demographics, you 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 cannot grow your economy rapidly enough. You for uh, Chad, the DRC, even Angola, you have to grow your economy about 15% a year if you are going to stay on top of those demographics. That's not possible. So demographics is often underestimated in terms of its importance of advancing the more productive nature of the African population. Sorry for speaking at length. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we are now going to move into the Q&A part of the webinar and I open the floor for uh, questions and comments. Uh, I'll just uh, ask a question uh, to, to all of you uh, <clears throat> about uh, the scramble for Africa because we know that we have so many players now vying for attention and resources of Africa. China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, <clears throat> United Arab Emirates, India, Japan, what have you. And many of these, they bring uh, alternative uh, development and growth models uh, that serve uh, as alternatives to the European and the American models uh, which espouse democratic governance and market liberalism. So what are your thoughts on, on this? Uh, we'll start with Yaki. Uh, thanks, Oli. Um, Africa needs all the, the partners and all the help that it can get. And uh, what concerns many of us on the continent is that we may become particularly trapped kind of or caught again in a kind of a competition between the United States and China in particular. We need partnerships on the continent uh, for Africa's development. Now, our scenarios also indicate that um, foreigners are not going to develop Africa. What we need is we need African agency. We need to manage these partnerships in a positive manner. And there are many countries, uh, Finland is one of them, that can help us to build the institutional capacity to manage um, tenders, contracts, uh, to improve our ombudsman system, our auditing functions, and, and all of these uh, key, uh, uh, for example, our way in which we collect revenues, tax regimes. And these are real um, uh, important ways in which the international community can assist uh, Africa. So the concern really is that um, it's not, uh, there is a great scramble for Africa again, but it is will Africa respond with more agency? Will we take ownership of our own development agenda? And I think for me that is absolutely critical. Thank you for that. Uh, Lisa, uh, Marty, would you like to add some points to, to, to this discussion on the alternative uh, development and growth models? Yes, for sure. Lisa, do you want to start? Uh, yes. Uh, well, um, the developing model of uh, of China, of course, is different from that of uh, the Nordic countries or Europe, and uh, and indeed, uh, China, Russia, Turkey, 
uh, the Gulf countries have uh, increasing presence in 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 Africa, and uh, and uh, it might be that the current global backlash in democratization has also something to do with the increasing role of China in global politics and also in Africa. So, uh, so I I am concerned of the of the model that these authoritarian countries can bring with them and uh, we have seen in in Af africa in in i mean countries like rwanda and ethiopia are proceeding with uh, many sectors and at the same time uh, the the they are also I mean, they are very authoritarian also. So um, um, I, I'm concerned and I think that we have to take the presence of these other global actors seriously also from the ideological point of view and try to enhance dialogue and and uh, try to keep good governance and uh, human rights and uh, democratic values on the agenda thanks for that lisa uh, marty any any comments you have on the scramble for africa and the competition yeah w one thing is that we have to keep in mind we we speak in case of africa about 54 you you and recognized uh, um, sovereign states i mean they have to make the decisions the decision decisions on the development models are also in their hands and we have to try to encourage them and then also civil society business sector in their countries to to take responsibility i mean they are account, accountable to their people on, on, on the models they have chosen and, and, and policies they have chosen. Um, so what I'm a little bit concerned is that if the European Union, if they only look at the, this competition and, and try to be, may I say, better than, than Russia or China or some other uh, competitors, then I'm not sure if this is this is very helpful. I think what the European Union should should be is to look at their own strengths and, and, and opportunities. For example, the, to my understanding and my experience is that the European Union is perhaps the only one who is really for for sustainability. This is maybe not that much uh, the case of, of of the com other competitors there. So we have this kind of strength, sustainability. Also the European Union, we have, uh, I mean, the, the ge geographical pro proxy. I mean, we, we are very close to each other. We have historical links uh, and we have um, and, and some other assets, I mean, in our relationship to build partnerships. Also, I think um, European Union is uh, one of the few real players who are for free trade in a proper way. And, and this is something uh, that the African countries uh, appreciate also. I mean, if they want free trade integration, then the European Union is there and, and Finland included. And then also when what Lisa mentioned about these uh, values, I think Nordic countries also have these values as one of the big assets they have when we, we try to build uh, partnerships with, uh, with African countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I will then now proceed to, to look at some of the questions and comments from the chat box. And the first one is from Christian Meseth to Jackie. In your presentation, you had the highest benefit of trade liberalization from low income countries. This seems somewhat counterintuitive one would assume that the likes of South Africa or Ghana would benefit most. Could you explain your paradigm or evidence uh, that leaks uh, would benefit? That's the first one. And then the second one also to Yaki is that um, that's from Eva Nilsson. 
how do you see that the global megatrends on electrification and transition to renewables, renewable energy will affect African countries' future relations with the rest of the world and within the continent? Over to you, Jackie. Okay, so you can see the PowerPoint again, where I'm, um, I showed at the bottom um, Africa uh, divided into low, low middle, upper middle, high income countries in the continent, and the countries are color coded at the bottom. At the top, I showed that what gives the most benefit for low income countries. You can see that the implementation of the continental free trade area for low income countries is third most important in terms of the impact that it will have in 2033. By 2043, it's the most important. You can see the same holds for lower middle income countries and for upper middle income countries, the trade or the implementation of the African continental free trade area gives the largest benefit. We are measuring here the impact of, the, of each of all of the 11 scenarios on their impact on improvements in GDP per capita. So if I, if, if I, so uh, the, it is your richer countries that will benefit your more diversified economies like South Africa um, that will benefit uh, most from the African continental free trade area. And over long term horizons, the um, implementation of the free trade area will have the largest impact of any scenario over time. And that's simple. We don't have large enough internal markets. It's the reason why the European Union was created, to create a large, nobody will come and invest and establish a fact, factory in South Africa to manuf manufacture goods in Africa if their only market is Zambia or Zimbabwe. They will come and establish a factory if their market is Southern Africa or the whole of the continent. So free trade is incredibly important for, for Africa. Oli, what was the second question? Um, uh, I closed the chat function. so. You had a second one that you wanted me to respond to? Yeah, sure. That was from Eva Nilsson. Uh, how do you see that the global mega trends of electrification and transition to renewable energy will affect African countries' future relations with the rest of the world and within the continent? So on mega trends on electrification and re renewables. So um, uh, again, if you look at the slide that I have, Arvind, you will see that leapfrogging for low income countries and low middle income countries is the most important. And wh what we have modeled is we have modeled the impact of uh, renewables in terms of uh, the impact that that can have on the more rapid electrification of, um, of Africa, particularly of rural Africa. Without electricity, nothing is possible. And renewables provides the opportunity for a distribute for um, how the more rapid um, introduction of household electricity in Africa. Um, we've just completed a big study on the DRC where we have said that the Democratic Republic of the Congo should maybe, you all would know about the Grand Inga scheme, Inga 1, Inga 2, Inga 3, and then the Grand Inga scheme. And we are saying, and our modeling indicates that the DRC will do much better if it forgets about the Grand Inga beyond Inga 3 and focuses on using of renewables and off-grid mini and other solutions uh, to provide household electricity for its people. It will increase its human capital component more than the Grand Inga will ever do. Um, so, of course, the introduction of renewables is changing the global power relationship completely. Um, we used to be that the oil producers, particularly the Middle East, had all the power, OPEC, that um, renewables means that power is becoming uh, decentralized, distributed. Um, so it's changing everything. Of course, a country like the DRC with its uh, cobalt uh, now becomes very important because we have a large supply of rare earth minerals that is becoming a big factor in the competition, um, global competition. Uh, between particularly uh, China, the EU and, and the US on uh, the ability to particularly go up the battery curve. Um, as you would all know, the, the next big challenge is unlocking the ability to store electricity. Once that happens, and that can't be, you know, that's 5, 10, 20, 15 years away. It's not that far. Um, once we have the ability to store electricity, um, uh, uh, the global supply of power of, of oil and all of these kind of things become irrelevant and uh, you have a we're entering an era of energy abundance not of energy scarcity 
for Africa, um, there are, th in my view, and I'm completely generalizing when I make this point, particularly for sub-Saharan Africa, our first priority is to provide people with household electricity. Without household electricity, it's not possible to develop. The second opportunity is to provide them with access to the internet. It is the only way we can, and to provide internet access across all of Africa. It is the only way that we have a chance of leapfrogging on education and, and all kinds of other things. So these are, in my view, these two components, uh, household electricity, uh, internet access for all of Africans, down to every African will do more to unlock Africa's development potential than almost any other intervention in, in my belief. Thanks for that, Jackie. Then I see a comment from Antti Varas. I think he's a colleague from MFA. Just a comment uh, related to Lisa's question in giving more political power to regional organizations. The problem in better utilization of regional economic communities is that they sometimes have overlapping functions here yeah, indeed they also compete uh, for the same resources and funding and all of them would like to have a political role there are also the same people sitting in these organizations mm. and at the same time the african union is becoming more involved in bilateral issues especially what's going on uh, here in uh, in the horn of africa so uh yanti is sitting in addis abeba so i can see what he's saying uh, <clears throat> so somehow these uh, overlapping institutions are sometimes neutralizing each other and then we have these deadlocks inside and between them and they can't agree on anything anymore <laughs> lisa do you want to <laughs> comment on that yes. briefly yes. very briefly yeah Yes, indeed, the overlapping roles are are a problem. I, I, I think that uh, instead of eight uh, regional co communities that have that are now recognized by the African Union, five could be enough to cover uh, the continent. And of course, the division of uh, tasks with the African Union is is also uh, important. Uh, and uh, but what I think that what what uh, what, uh, what I was trying to say is that these uh, regional organizations probably could have potential to do more in because if they if they could harmonize uh, taxation policies if they could harmonize. Uh, um, um, even education policies, university education, mobility of uh, of st of students. If they could um, uh, uh, enhance uh, uh, security uh, cooperation, the 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 potential would be huge. Uh, but at the moment, it seemed to me that uh, the regional organisations are weak and maybe even neutralizing each other because the member states are weak. The member states are not even paying their membership fees. They are not even sending their representatives to uh, Pan-African uh, Parliament. Uh, but uh, but uh, could it be possible for the international community to support, for instance, these regional organizations, even though the the member states, the nation states are weak? Could, could it be a possible model for Africa to, to put more resources and to empower more these regional bodies? This is uh, somewhat speculative, but, uh, but at the moment, uh, the, the, the uh, capacity uh, uh, beyond norm setting, as Yaki was also saying, and, and beyond uh, uh, making these kind of agreements from eco of, of economic integration, for instance, is it, not very much. We, we really do not know if the Ag African free trade area will be properly implemented or not. It, it might not be implemented properly because of the weakness of the nation states and uh, and uh, the weakness of the governance at the nation state level. Thanks for that, Lisa. Then I have a question from Sanna Lisa Taivalma. She's actually uh, Finland's top agricultural development expert and has worked 
uh, in Africa for, for a long time. So I think this is for Yaki. Uh, one continent-wide mega trend uh, is food insecurity, the prevalence of stunting, uh, which affects human capacity and development, yeah, and results in how the continent will uh, develop in the future. So, I mean, can Yaki, can you say something about the the challenge uh, of food insecurity? And you did mention in your presentation that agriculture plays a very important role in the development of the continent. Um, thanks very much. As, as most of the people on this call would know, Africa um, is particularly food insecure. Uh, we import ever increasing numbers of food, despite the fact that we have some of the largest um, uh, agricultural potential globally. You know, we all speak about Africa's agricultural potential, but Africa's leaders have never done anything about uh, actually, with one or two exceptions, uh, to really exploit Africa's potential. Um, so um, going up the agricultural um, yield curve is, is absolutely critical to the future of the continent. But the, the, the focus of that agricultural curve should not be to create food for export. It should be firstly and primarily to feed Africans and using indigenous crops and smallholder and so on. So in our modeling that we've done is we, um, those countries that um, uh, do not uh, get efficient, sufficient calories per capita. We first provide them w uh, in our modeling with sufficient calories per capita because um, stunting is a lifelong challenge. And in my country, South Africa, stunting rates are 27% of, ch of uh, kids under five. It is, it is disgraceful. It, you cannot develop a society with those levels of stunting. So um, uh, there is much that can be done, um, but it requires that African leaders really invest in making agriculture a, a real priority and not only talk about their requirement to have access to the European or whatever agricultural market, which in my view is completely irrelevant. Um, Africa needs access to Europe's manufacturing uh, uh, value added market, not to its, its agriculture. But in any case, so um, agricultural reform is difficult, but it's not impossible. Um, it is um, may, all countries that have embarked upon a um, productivity um, change um, has has had to undergo agricultural um, reform. Agriculture is important, but it will not provide let me, one final point on that. Agriculture will, however, a, an agricultural revolution in Africa will, however, reduce employment on the continent. It will not increase employment. This is also very important to understand. People often speak about the potential that agriculture in Africa has to provide employment. Yes, down the value chain, uh, but not on the farm, if I can, or on the small holding farm. In actual fact, as you modernize and move away from um, your um, subsistence agriculture, the number of people employed in agriculture will in actual fact decline. So you have to you, you have to find different ways of uh, employing them. And, and typically what happens within the broader agro processing sector, um, um, employment increases. And that's one of the ways in which you can then embark upon the manufacturing transition, going from, agri from agriculture to agro processing and up that value chain. And a number of countries, Kenya, um, South Africa, Ethiopia are, are embarked upon that uh, upon that process. Thank you for that, Yaki. Uh, Marty, I see your hand is up. Uh, what, did you have a comment on, on this or something previously? Please go ahead. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think we, we should pay more attention to, to this question of agriculture. It's very much linked with, um, with uh, the land question, and it's also linked with uh, development models. Like we have seen in the past in, in some countries, uh, or, or perhaps uh, it, we have, or they have inherited it from the colonial time. The the, the system or the model they they they, they chose was um, like collectivist, collectivic, um, you know, agriculture, collectivizing it, and and and, it, and then they realized it, it didn't work. I mean, in in order to to feed the people and so on, neither for for export purposes. So the, this collective um, model of uh, development didn't work. While in some other countries, they had this uh, commercial uh, approach to, 
to agriculture and, and for food product and so on. I mean, and now I, I, I don't know if there is a possibility to find like a, like a common model that is uh, fit for all African countries. Uh, especially we cannot uh, dictate it from, from outside. I mean, it's something they have to, to decide themselves. And now we come also to the question of integration. We, we see that the countries are so different economically, but also politically and historically and culturally and so on. Now, how far they can move ahead in terms of integration, continental or regional uh, integration? How far they can go? I mean, on the other hand, we can see that the, the leaders at the moment, they want to keep the, the sovereignty power in their own hands. They don't w want to give it to, to others. So it's kind of uh, nationalism in the same way as we have in, in European countries. I mean, th these kind of questions we have in mind. But uh, as I said, we, we need to have more, how can I say, focus on this agriculture, food security, land ownership. Mm. It has also something to do with forest forestation and so on green, uh, build green, back green and bed, better. I mean, it's, it's very complicated issue, but we need to perhaps another occasion to, to discuss it. Thanks. Uh, we have about seven minutes, so we're about to close, but still a few questions, uh, maybe very precise ones. Uh, first to Yaki again, but how do you see the role of uh, girls edu and women's education? And there was something about that uh, Kati Antalainen uh, from our, uh, that's the Ministry of Education, was surprised to see the fairly low projected impact of education in the graph. So maybe you want to comment on that. Thanks very much. Yes, I, I've been trying to respond also um, in the comment section to some of these issues that have been raised. The, the problem with education is that it is, um, um, it's a magic, uh, education lifts all, it's the tide that lifts all boats. But it takes two generation. Uh, it takes a generation, two decades, for a child to move through the education system, and there's been a huge focus in Africa on improving the rollout of education, but quality is um, is a, a big problem. You fix an education system from the bottom upward, uh, so you focus on. Um, not a really preschool, but maybe that, but and primary, and then you fix lower secondary, then upper secondary, then tertiary. That's how you gain momentum from a developmental perspective on education. What has happened in many African countries is that if you look at the curve on expenditure, then there's often a focus on upper secondary or tertiary education, an insufficient focus on getting the primary education, lower secondary and upper secondary sorted out. South Africa is a good example. We've had protests that have led to the fact that we've introduced a, a free tertiary education. It's crazy for South Africa. We can't afford it. We should be focusing on fixing the quantity and the quality and the representation uh, girls and boys in, um, in, in primary and in secondary education. These make a big contribution, but um, the contribution of education in Africa is slow. Um, because it takes such a long time, it, requ it requires a lot of money. In my view, um, uh, historically, the the Prussian school of educate of model of education. Uh, if if we are thinking that you can resolve Africa's education backlog by a teacher standing in front of a class, it will never happen. We can't build enough classrooms. We can't train enough teachers to do that. That is one of the reasons why we have to find ways of using uh, modern technology to speed up the provision of education. Um, th there is no alternative for the continent. Um, th there, um, uh, education is foundational uh, to the improvement of the, our, our labor force, but um, we would have to look at different ways uh, which is why I make the point about uh, provision of household electricity, internet access and all of these kind of things. We are so far behind and we are falling further and further behind both in quality and in quantity, as well as on, on the gender dimension of education. Right, thanks. Uh, so we are about to close and uh, with I think the closing remarks, but we have one final question and this is maybe for our uh, outside guests Yaki and Lisa on democracy and rule of law.
I know my colleague from MFA, Laura Torvinen, has been working on the rule of law and democracy issues. So basically the question she poses is that, do you have any thoughts how Finland particularly, and of course other actors, but now we're talking about Finland, how could we best support democratic development on the continent? And, and with that question, you can any, any clo closing remarks you may have on the sort of future of Africa? Very easy question, isn't it? <laughs> Over to you, Jaki. Um, thank you very much, Oli, and to colleagues for a really fascinating uh, uh, debate and discussion and for the opportunity to present some, some of my research. I'm always confronted by this challenge of democracy and the rule of law because uh, the quality of democracy in Africa is poor. Um, but I make the point that you need to step back and take a long-term view on this. And you really have to ask what are the essential components of democracy, accountability and so on, that um, Finland and others should focus on. It's a different way, and this is a very difficult uh, thing to say and to do, but what are the what is the appropriate level of democracy for African countries? Um, what are the key tenets that translate democracy into accountability? Because that's our problem. Um, and I made the point in my presentation that Africa faces a unique challenge. It is both democratizing and developing at the same time, whereas the history in the rest of the world was you first develop and then you democratize. But democracy at low levels of development is often unstable. And in actual fact, it often detracts from uh, transitions. You can only look at, at South Sudan, Somalia, where we try to introduce uh, elections that introduce competitive politics in a situation where you have spent hundreds of millions of dollars and euros to try and build a national consensus uh, on something. So at low levels of development, democracy um, presents many, many challenges, I think, for Africa's development. And in an perfect world, uh, which none of us have, um, I would um, uh, I would tend to focus on the importance of development, particularly economic, equitable, inclusive economic growth at low levels of development. Now, I say that and I, I know that many people on the call and myself, my instincts, instincts are not, not about that. But there is many things that Finland can do to build this accountability that we are speaking about, how you translate uh, democracy, thin electoral democracy into substantive, what some would refer to liberal democracy. It is about building the accountability institutions, uh, how to uh, get more, how to build your tax regimes, ombudsman, how to build the parliamentary oversight, um, and these kind of, uh, of contributions, uh, how to manage um, um, uh, um, development assistance, how to manage contracts, how to get the Chinese to work with the Americans, with the Europeans in the implementation of projects that you benefit from all of them. Because what we do not need in Africa is another competition. What we need is we need our development challenges are such and we need all the assistance we can get and we, we need to find a way of working collaboratively with all of them. It can't be a, a matter of choice. So um, I'm afraid I don't have any instant solutions on the democracy rule of law issues. Um, we, we, we struggle with that and um, I think it's going to remain a challenge. But in this global order that we are seeing, where Africa decides to go is going to be important also for Europe. If you find a, demo a substantive democratic regression in Africa, uh, it will reflect globally on the rule of law in international, at international and other circles. So uh, what, what happens in Africa is going to matter what happens globally. With 55 members um, in the international system, it's important that uh, Africans work to protect their interests and their interests are not the same as the interests of the US or China. It is the interests of small countries that need the rule of law in their own protection. Oli and colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of my, my insights. Thank you, that was fantastic. I'm really proud that I got you on board on this uh, webinar. Lisa and Marty, any, any final departing thoughts? No, thank you very much for the discussion and uh, and the contributions also from the uh, questions and chat uh, uh, 
channels. Thank you also, for, also from my side. Um, to, to respond quickly to, to Laura's question, rule of law, human rights, democracy, these kind of sensitive issues, in my own presentations, where they were included under the, the theme political opportunities. Um, and, and this is one part of our new Africa strategy. I mean, we can conduct political dialogue with, um, with African uh, actors, governmental, but then also non-governmental actors on, this, on these issues. Um, and in this way, we can have political opportunities and strengthen our political relations. But anyway, thank you very much for, for this uh, discussion and let's continue. Thank you. Thank you for this very timely and strategic uh, debate. Thank you so much for all the participants and I hereby close the uh, webinar.